I'm joined from Cape Town by the President of the International Science Council, Dia Reddy, and from Dublin, a patron of the Council, Mary Robinson, who of course is also former President of Ireland and UN Commissioner for Human Rights. Welcome to you both. You've jointly penned an op-ed where you write that COVID-19 has shown that people are ready to change their behaviour for the good of humanity. And yet, Mary Robinson, this isn't the same scale of behaviour change we've seen in relation to the fight against climate change. And I'm curious about that. Do you think it suggests that people still can't accept that climate change poses a genuine threat to humanity? I think that's the case, that people were not frightened. They were not uh, aware of an imminent danger in the way that everybody has become with the sudden but very real dramatic threat of COVID-19 and people were prepared to collectively act on that. And that's a wonderful lesson in the climate context because it is just human behaviour collectively that is protecting us from COVID-19. We have no vaccine. And if we didn't comply with lockdown and with social distancing, washing our hands, all of that, then it would be it would overwhelm health systems even more. And uh, we're protecting the vulnerable, we're protecting health and care workers. Uh, I hope that we're also realising that there is the threat of climate, the climate crisis. We were just beginning, but not enough uh, to realise. And now I think we're more thoughtful. Dyer, what's your view? And perhaps you could give us some insight into the level of global cooperation we've seen during the response to COVID-19. Uh, Yes, absolutely. Um, Here we have um, something happening in real time. The general public is seeing for itself what science advice is all about, what, um, how the scientific community is engaging, also really, really important aspects of that process, like the uncertainties. You know, it's a little messy. It's not absolutely clean. And um, it's really difficult within the scientific community, uh, let alone then engaging with policymakers and the like. So there's so much that we are witnessing that is, I think, so relevant and so important to our efforts in um, combating climate change. With COVID-19, we've seen this general openness to and curiosity about science. There seems to be less tension, yet, Dyer, the same can't be said for climate science. Yes, uh, you know, maybe one could start by asking, you know, why is this so? Why is it the case with uh, with climate change? Well, um, look, uh, there, there are many, many reasons for this, I think, uh, but uh, you know, perhaps by way of example, um, th- there are a number of vested interests, um, industries and the like, um, in whose interests, short term anyway, it would not be to, uh, let's say, reduce their dependence on fossil fuels. Let me also, you know, add at this point the uh, the role of the of the climate denialist lobby, um, anti-science movements, uh, pseudoscience movements. Um, I would not underestimate their um, their uh, power, as it were, to influence particular politicians, other policy makers, um, who might, in the first instance, be receptive to such views any way. Um, That really does not help. Mary, on the one hand, we've seen that the world can act swiftly, and that's really inspiring when it comes to the fight against climate change. But on the other hand, these changes have brought about significant costs, particularly economic costs. Could that actually act as a deterrent in the fight against climate change? The truth is we can't go back to business as usual because that was leading us to a catastrophe in a very short time. Uh, We were told by the scientists, by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in October 2018, that we had to reduce by 45% at least our carbon emissions by 2030. That's less than 10 years away. And we were not on course. I remember being very depressed, to be honest, in January. And as chair of the elders, I'm not allowed to be depressed. We've got to bring hope. And I was finding it difficult because I couldn't see in the preparations we were to be making for the COP26, which was to take place in Glasgow. Obviously, now it's being postponed to next year. But I couldn't see the ambition that was needed by countries, not any country, to be honest. 
And so it, it was really beginning to be quite depressing. And then COVID hit. And I think on top of all the things that, that Adaya has been saying, uh, think of the compassion. That's a really important thing, the neighborliness, the solidarity, because uh, it's wrong to say that COVID-19 is a great leveler. It isn't. It actually has exacerbated the inequalities. It's made them even more evident. So we had a, a, a broken business as usual system that wasn't going to get us to where we needed to be and that was terribly unequal. Can we build back better in the language of the UN um, and do so in a way that completely aligns with getting to zero carbon and zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. So every country needs to fully commit to that. Every uh, city, every town, every every business, every community. Uh, we have to have whole of country and whole of community um, on this. And it wouldn't have happened without this kind of openness to empathy. It could go either way now. Um, in fact, I'm seeing, for example, in China, which is coming out sooner because they dealt with the COVID-19 in a Chinese way pretty effectively, uh, but they're actually building new coal plants. Um, and that's not a good example. They're, they're leaders in wind and solar and electric vehicles. If they would only just you know, go that way even more and invest that way even more, because going new coal plants is not the way forward. Daya, there's no doubt that we have a really important opportunity right now. How important is what we do next? It is extremely important for us to be aware that there is hope, um, that there are not only governments, but uh, non-governmental organisations, various types of organisations, including in the private sector, who are taking this very, very seriously and are addressing the um, addressing the, the problem with the degree of urgency that, that it merits. One certainly hopes that countries around the world, regions around the world, will um, take similar steps. It brings me back to the whole business of cooperation. And you know, if I may return to COVID-19 for just a moment. On the one hand, uh, with regard to COVID-19, we have seen astonishing levels of cooperation within the scientific community, scientific community, health workers and the like around the world, sharing knowledge, um, whether through formal means, uh, talking to each other, um, really getting to grips with the problem. We have not seen similar levels of cooperation amongst governments. To some extent, uh, it's been beset by political and other considerations. Coming back to climate change, we are going to, in addition to everything else, we are going to need those kinds of levels of cooperation across regions, intergovernmental, um, if we are going to be successful in addressing the challenge of climate change. Mary, you speak regularly with world leaders. When you speak to them one-on-one -on -one about climate change, do you get a sense of their appreciation of the scale of the problem? Well, let me answer you in a slightly different way because it gives me great pleasure. Look at the women-led countries at the moment, like Angela Merkel in Germany, like the prime ministers of Norway, uh, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Jacinta Ardern in New Zealand, the president of Taiwan. They took tough decisions and they brought their people with them in uh, a really behavioral leadership way. And they are doing better um, on tackling COVID. So uh, I think one of the things that COVID has taught us is that leadership matters because those who delayed for political reasons, for personal ambition reasons or whatever, um, it'll be cruelly exposed how they caused far more deaths and far more illness than was necessary and hurt their economies more because they'd be slower to come back, etc. So I'm hoping in a real sense, we'll see the same leadership uh, coming out of COVID in a way that completely aligns with dealing with that other uh, crisis. I mean, uh, Christiana Figueres has described quite well um, in a sort of visual way, we have three waves. We have the health COVID wave, we have the economic wave, and behind that, we have the climate crisis. The clock is ticking. And in this moment, in this strange moment that, the, that we're in, 
Is there anything that you'd like to say finally about the good things that have come from the COVID-19 response that we can harness moving forward? I do think it's really very striking how much people are seeing the fragility of our humanity now. And they are more open to compassion, to neighbourliness, as has been said, to cooperation together at so many different levels. And that empathy wasn't there before in relation to climate change. I remember often trying to persuade people, you know, about climate justice and talking about the poorest countries, small island states, and people's eyes would glaze over. It wasn't them, you know, and they didn't feel it. Now, when you're open to suffering, and again, I want to make it clear, uh, we're not all suffering at the same level. There, uh, again, I'm, I, I repeat that COVID exacerbates the inequalities and the degree of suffering. If you're locked in, a, um, in a, an abusive household, um, if your g- daughter is out of education in parts of the world, she's into child marriage and, and so on. There are many, many inequities. But um, when you are suffering, you are more open to the suffering of others. And I think we have a world with people sitting at home being more thoughtful, being more open to the suffering of others. And that is my hope that as we begin to come out and as if we get the leadership to come out the right way, we will um, learn these lessons and that the rich world will become much less of a throwaway world, much more thoughtful about consuming and knowing we have a collective power which we exercised during COVID together, and that young people will continue to lead. Maybe I could end with the very good message of the former chair of the elders whom I inherited the chair from, Kofi Annan. He often said, you are never too young to lead, you are never too old to learn. So let the young lead because it's their future more than anything. Let the old, like me, learn more about how to adapt to a better future for our children and grandchildren. That is beautifully said and a very hopeful place to leave our chat. Thank you both so very much for your time. Remember to hit subscribe for our regular videos. And while you're here, check out our past episodes.